Getting ready. We're almost live on YouTube. We're all good. We're just chit chatting. Good, good. I hope you guys all had a lovely Mother's Day Sunday, even if those are not mothers or. <laughs> I might have said this on air on TM101 before, but it gets me every year. Mothering Sunday is on a different, in a different month in the UK, which is where my mother lives. Mm. And it, I get the anxiety every single year because it's the the North American one comes around and I've already sent my mom flowers this year, but still something in the back of my head goes, oh shit, you forgot Mother's Day again. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Is When is Mother's Day in the UK? I thought it was like, it's like March. two months ago. I think March, it's, yeah. It's in March. Oh, I just it always catches the, me uh, out. <laughs> yeah, my mother's British my living in the US, oh. so she gets it twice. Oh, that's, her fu- that, <laughs> that's that's her reasoning. <laughs> so you just gotta make sure you don't forget her because she'll be mad at you twice. <laughs> yep. That's true. My mom's been mad at me for 30 years, so it's just okay. The other side. <laughs> get a real job. <laughs> I don't get yelled at by my mom anymore because she passed away. So I get back. I get, I get I get a pass. <laughs> But she can still be pissed off up there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, they just come in the form of lightning bolts now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Some like weird little <laughs> reminder. <laughs> All right. All right. We ready? have everyone. Oh, yeah. We're ready Should to roll. We? No. Yeah, let's do take it. Us, take us off, Doug. All right. Well, as you can see, Mark and Henry are not with us today. Um, so Mark's beautiful radio voice will not be doing the intro and you guys are stuck with me. But... Um, Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, this is episode 74 of Tour Management 101. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, and for anyone that's in the Zoom, uh, please make sure to change your chat settings to panelists and attendees. Um, and hey to everyone tuning in on YouTube, we'll be monitoring the chat there and picking up any questions and sending those through. Um, so what we're going to try and do now is what we did manage to do last week <laughs> and go for MJ and go for a yes. quick tip of even the week. Though, even though I'm here for a minute. Even though you're here. <laughs> even though I'm here for oh, just a little bit. Just a little bit this week. Okay, here we go. Let's try this. Go for MJ. Hi, it's Mary Jo. This week's quick tip is always make sure the bus and the bus bays are locked, even if there are people on the bus. Lock the bus not only when you leave it, but also behind you when you get on. Did that work? Hooray! Hey! We're going to get there with our little (laughs) Jeopardy audio thing. Always lock the bus, people. Always lock the bus. (laughs) With that, I'll pass over to my friend, 5-1. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, the man, the myth, and now the minor motion picture, Mr. Malcolm Welton. Oh, in today's installment of a conversation with, we're truly honored to be speaking with this true legend in our industry. From humble beginnings in LA, he started in the music business at the age of 19 and never looked back. His 40 plus year career has seen him work with some of the biggest names in the business, including Tina Turner, Cher, Sade, Janet Jackson, Beyonce, Pink, Aerosmith, and Paulo Abdul. Although he's been the production manager of some of the most intricate and massive productions on the road, but always puts teamwork and positive attitudes first. Please welcome one of my mentors and one of all of our mentors, the amazing <laughs> Mr. Malka. <laughs> Well done. The crowd goes wild. <laughs> oh, that's some funny stuff. Hey, Mo, Hello, you, everybody. Hello, everybody. That was, I'll, I'll pay you later, uh, Dave, uh, for whatever that. Would PayPal, be. please. PayPal. Okay. Not Bitcoin. Okay. Right. Malcolm, to kick things off, tell us about your background and how you came to decide you wanted to be in the music business and how you got into it. Uh, I, I start off uh, wanting to get into the music business. Um, just because of the love of music. Um, I truly love music and musicians. I just think it's, uh, I think it's miraculous that someone can pick up an instrument and, and play something and make that sound, whatever that sound coming out of that instrument, beautiful. 
um, I find that amazing. Uh, and growing up, I, you know, as you do, as you're growing up, you're, you, you get records and albums and stuff. And you start reading that back in the day, they had liner notes and they kind of had all the information on the record and how it was created from the musicians to the writers, to the producer, to the recording engineer, yada, yada. And I've seen a recording engineer and producer. I kept seeing that on, on records all the time. And then I started trying to figure out what did that person do? What did that mean to be the recording engineer? So I did, you know, got a little study. I'm, let's say I'm probably 12 or 13 years old when I started to realize that. And then, you know, as you go along, you, if you get older, you try to figure out what you want to do in life. And uh, going to school, I, I grew up in South Central LA, just a poor kid from South Central LA. I went to uh, Crenshaw High in Los Angeles and a bunch of my other peers in school were all going off to do business courses or do become engineers, mechanical engineers and all that kind of stuff. And that wasn't what I was interested in. I was interested in music. And so I was trying to figure out how to do that. And then eventually I uh, ran across an ad in a uh uh, a weekend section of the Los Angeles Times called the calendar section. And in that calendar section, it it would have all the entertainment stuff in it uh, and all entertainment and, 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 and arts in this in this one section. And then I, one day I'm looking through it and it had an ad in there for for the school called Soundmasters Recording Engineering School. And I was like, oh my God, this is, I think this is what I'm looking for. And I went off and called them and asked them about information on the school. And they told me, you no, know, they, they taught engineering, recording engineering and live uh, sound reinforcement and yada, yada. And I was like, oh man, this is me, this is it. So I, but it was expensive. It was you no, know, for me, a poor kid in LA, that was really expensive. It ended up being on close to like 10 grand uh, for me to go to that school. So um, I was working at a grocery store um, as a stock clerk and a checker. Um, and so I just kind of put myself through school to do that. And I finished. Um, and when I even went up the pitch for the school, they said the pitch in the school was like, if you once you graduate our school, if you don't get a job, it's your personality. And I was like, Ooh, man, that's okay. I think I got a pretty good personality. And then, um, so I finished, I took all the, I took the courses. I even took courses that I didn't even want. I took the, I took a video course, although it was back then, cause this is the early eighties. It, it wasn't that, it wasn't that extensive. Uh, and then I took the sound reinforcement course, which I wasn't really interested in either. Cause I didn't want to go, I didn't want to do live sound. Uh, but I finished, finished all the classes, did everything, did got good grades. And then literally the placement literally was just a piece of paper with all the contact information for the recording studios. Um, but the problem was, is that they were, you know, let's say at the end of every semester or every course, they were putting out maybe like maybe six students and say they put out maybe... 12 students a year there's only so many studios and they're constantly putting these students out and then at the same time in the, in the early 80s things were kind of transitioning to where a lot of a lot of artists were starting to have studios in their homes so uh, a lot of things were kind of changing so it took a while for me to try to find a um, to try to find a recording gig and I, I couldn't. So I, my, uh, my grandmother who, um, who worked for this family in Beverly Hills as a, as a housekeeper and nanny um, had worked for this uh, comedy writer, big comedy writer back in the fifties and sixties by the name of Stan Freeberg. And he, he was really big. He was, he was the guy back then. And so she she helped raise their daughter Donna Freeberg and you know and took care of the house and everything and uh, my grandmother eventually retired in the early seventies and then but she stayed in touch with the Freeberg family and they would they would always call her Donna would always call her on the on on either her birthdays or on holidays and um, 
So one day she, my grandmother is talking to Donna on the phone and Donna says, hey, you know, what's what's Malcolm going on? What is he doing? And I hadn't seen her in probably at least 15, 15 years or, or longer. And my grandmother told her what I was doing and what I was trying to do. And and then Donna said, oh, well, my son, I mean, my, my, my husband is doing that. He, he should talk to my husband. And so she said, you should have Malcolm call me. And so my grandmother said, OK. And then the next like, you know, a couple of days later, I'm over my grandmother's house and she tells me to she talked to Donna Freeberg and that I should give her a call because um, she her husband does what I want to do. And then I was like, oh, OK, but I didn't I didn't think my grandmother had the slightest idea of what I was trying to do or does, you know, uh, I just didn't, I didn't, couldn't fathom that she understood that because most, a lot of people didn't understand what it was I was trying to do. Um, and so I, I kind of blew her off. Then like about a week goes by and my grandmother asked me, had I spoken to Donna? And I was like, oh no, no mom, I didn't, I didn't speak to her. She's like, boy, you better come in here and call her before I smack you, get in here. So <laughs> I went in there and I called Donna and I spoke to her and we chatted and I told her what I was up to and she said, you know, her husband is that's what he's did and that I should contact him and, and yada, yada. And she gave me his information and I called and I still was thinking all oh, these people still don't know what I, I want to do. Um, and so I made I contacted him and then uh, I went out out to the uh, out to North Hollywood where the studios that he uh, that his mom owned that his studio was inside of it was called DR Studios. I drove out there uh, to see what he had, and you know, it was a, uh, it was actually a, uh, I think it had, it was a dance studio, and I think it had about maybe four dance studios within this bigger complex, and then also within the bigger complex, they had a smaller studio that was just a voiceover studio that they did voiceover stuff for radio and TV, but then he also had um, a mobile recording truck as well. Uh, so after, you know, walking around and listening to him, I realized that he was real, that he did do stuff. And, you know, um, you know one thing led to another. Um, and then actually to back up a little bit. So the, the, the guy's mom that I was going to you know that I had met uh, and that was uh, her, her name was Debbie Reynolds and the, and the, the son uh, and the, 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 the husband to Donna Freeberg, his name was Todd. Uh, his name was Todd Fisher, uh, Debbie Reynolds, uh, who did singing in the rain and all that kind of stuff. That was his mother, DR Studios. That's what DR stood for was Debbie Reynolds. Todd Fisher was her son. And Eddie, Eddie Fisher Ed, was his father. Yeah. Yeah. Eddie Fisher was, yeah, well, it was his father. And then her, his brother, his, I'm sorry, his sister was uh, Carrie Fisher, uh, Princess Leia from Star Wars. So that's where that all kind of started. And then I, you know, I started working for Todd, doing little gigs here and there. Uh, and then eventually there was also a little church starting that started in DR studios that was going to be there after our, you know, like after seven or eight o'clock at night on Tuesdays, Thursdays. And then it would also do a Sunday morning, uh, Sunday morning service. And so I, Todd asked me that I want to, uh, take care of the sound for the church. And I told him, yeah, yeah, I, I, I would do it. Uh, I'd make myself available. But at the same time, I still was working at the grocery store. I, that was my that was my real job. I worked at the grocery store as a stock clerk and, and a cashier. And um, one thing led to another. The church kept growing. We went from one of the smaller studios at DR Studios to, to the, eventually to the biggest room. That got too big. So then eventually they had to go find a place that was bigger. So they found a, a theater in Beverly Hills that was that was reopening to do live concerts. It was an old movie palace kind of house, old art deco house. Uh, but before they opened, they were open for the church to be there while they were renovating. So the church went there. We were doing, they were doing services on like still on Tuesdays and Thursdays and, and, and Sundays. And I was the sound guy there. And the technical director of the theater one day asked me what I was up to and what did I want to do? And uh, I told him I wanted to be a, a recording engineer. 
And then, uh, and at that, at the time that he asked me, I was in a hurry to get out of there because I had to go do my real, go to my real job. And he was like, well, why are you rushing? I said, I have a real job. I got another job I do. I work at a grocery store, so I, I need to get to work. And he was like, well, you work here all day. I go, yeah, but I still got to pay my bills. This isn't paid bills. So I got to, I got to go to my other job. So he goes, oh, well, one of these days, next time you're here, we, we should talk. I go, well, okay, whatever. I leave. Then a couple of days later, I come back. And then he, you know, we have a conversation. He asked me, you know, what was my plans were? And I said, I'm, I'm doing this until I can get a job at the recording, at a recording studio. That's what my dreams are. And he said, um, okay, but you no, know, we're going to eventually open up here and we'll be doing shows. Would you like to work here? And I was like, oh, okay. And he go, I go, what would you, what do you want me to do? He goes, oh, well, you could be a part of, you no know, sound department. You could be the head sound guy. And I was like, oh, all right. Yeah, that sounds okay. And then uh, eventually he goes, I go, he goes, we set up another day. Well, you come in and we'll talk about you working here. And so I said, all right. And then a couple of days later, I come back to the theater and we sit down and talk. And then he, and this, this gentleman's name was Steve Schneider, just a, a great guy, another mentor, great, great guy. And he, um, we talk to him, I talk and we figure out, you know, he tells me this is, you no, know, we're going to eventually get the sound system in here. You'll be the head sound guy. But at the same time, everybody does a little bit of everything. We all kind of pitch in. And while we are still renovating the building, you know, we'll, I'll also put you on the crew to help part, be a part of that renovation. And so, you know, one of my first gigs there was helping screw in the chairs into the floor. And, you know, uh, I helped redo the, uh, the box office, took the old popcorn machine and stuff out and got rid of all that stuff where they sold the popcorn and turned that into like part of the box office. And also the same thing for the, uh, the bar, re renovating the bar, um, just doing all kinds of work and did all the, paint restoration inside the theater you know putting the gold leaf up and all the painting and all that stuff trying to restore it back to the art deco look and i worked there doing shows there eventually we did our first show i think was in i think our first show was in 81 the first show we did there was chick korea uh chick korea's band which was it was huge for me because that's what i grew up listening to was jazz and and gospel music and, and, and R&B, but especially jazz. And so it's Chick Corea and Return to Forever, Stanley Clark and Al Mola, that was like huge to me. They were like gods. And for me to my very first. Oh, Chick Corea, Chick Corea to be the first show. That was pretty, pretty amazing for me. So I, I worked there from 81 mm -hmm. through to 88. And we did everything from, you know, Amon Folk Ensemble, y um, uh, Yiddish Theater, um, uh, George Winston, piano solo stuff, Stefan Grappelli, uh, REM, Simple Minds, Devo. Oh, man, I need to bake everything, you know, the gamut of everything, because we were kind of a theater where it was, you, it was artists that were either coming up or some artists that were playing had been playing arenas and stadiums that were you know on their way down. So we did a little bit of everything, uh, and we we everybody jumped in and pitched in to make the shows happen and happen because uh, we were com at that point we started competing against um, Universal Amphitheater. They finally put a roof over that, and so that was our competition amongst uh, the other theaters that could open up. So. We, we, everybody pitched in and worked really hard to, uh, to try to pull everything off so that we could keep getting gigs. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> it seems like a common theme has been, you know, early on that you worked with people that whatever it took to get the gig done, you know? So is that where you got your work ethic from or where did you get that work ethic from? Like, do you think it came from them or your grandma or where did, where did it come <coughs> from? Sorry. I think the work ethic came up, the real work ethic, I think, came from my grandmother. She, my, my, my family uh, immigrated from Oklahoma uh, in the, I think it was like in the late 40s to, to California. And back in the day, uh, 
you know, uh, a good job for people of color, uh, black people back then. So it was domestic work. Uh, my grandmother was one of the, you know, she, when she worked for the Freeburg, she worked for the Freeburg, she worked for Lucille Ball, she worked for a bunch of different uh-huh. families back then. Uh, but, it, you know, she had a really good work ethic. You know, she normally, she would leave like on a Monday morning, but she didn't return back home until like a, either Friday night or Saturday morning. And then even when she would come back to our, our home, she still did stuff around the house. You know, she, she, she still took care of things. She still had, she was really passionate about her garden. Um, so you know, I think the work ethic started with my grandmother, but then at the same time, when I worked for Todd, he was a really, you know, you didn't know that he, you would never know that he was a rich kids, uh, 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 you know, his parents from, from some rich people or famous people because he worked really hard. Uh, Cause I think also because he had to prove himself, you know, he wasn't his mom and he wasn't his sister. So he had to prove what he, what his make was by, uh, uh, by working hard and then and, and proving uh, that he's getting what he's got based off of his own efforts. And then the same thing at the theater, uh, the theater, because we were in competition, we had to prove that we were willing to pull off whatever came our way. Um, so that was another place where, you know, you just, you just got to get it done. Yeah. So Mal, at some point, you ended up working in live production. Can you tell us how you kind of graduated from the dream of being a sound engineer and accepting that you are organically were working your way through a career in live, live entertainment, live production? Oh yeah. Um, so that came about It's different bands, different, you know, tour managers and stuff would come through my theater and it was this, uh, uh, young man back in the eighties that came through with a bunch of different acts uh, by the name of Marty Hom, who's another incredible mentor to me. He who came everyone, through. Who everyone who watches TM 101 would have met in February during the live production summit. Um, we interviewed Marty just the same way we're interviewing now. And he's right. fantastic and was obviously full of story and great information. So yeah. inspiring, so inspiring. Yeah, he, you know, he'd come through, like he came through with you no know, Bill Withers and the Crusaders and Jennifer Holiday and Hiroshima and a, a bunch of different acts. And then, you know, periodically I would go to him and ask him, hey, you know, take me on the road one of these days. I want to work for you, Marty. And at the same time, I didn't want to be, I never thought of myself being as a road guy. Uh, I never planned on being on the road. But at the same time, I knew I had to, you know, diversify myself. And then Marty said, yeah, one of these days, kid, one of these days. And one day he, he goes, hey, I got this gig coming up over the weekend, a couple of weekends. Uh, are you willing to, you, you willing, yeah, you want to you wanna help me with it? And I said, yeah, yeah, what, what is it? And he told me it was the Asian Pacific Festival at Pan Pacific Park. Uh, and so I went and did that. I did that festival with him as a stage manager slash carpenter guy. And that's also kind of how I got into that stage management thing because being a house sound and most bands that came through, most of them had a front of house engineer, but they didn't have a monitor engineer. So a lot of times I would be the monitor engineer. So I would, when the, the act would come in, I'd go up, I'd advance, get as much info, advancement some information from the act before they got there. I would set up the front of house the way they wanted it. I'd you know, get all their outboard gear set up, you know, get everything all patched for them and, and then get them going. And then I would go up on stage and then you know, run the monitor system for, for the band. Uh, and then with the doing right in the monitor system with the band, I learned that I had to always I always had to drive those artists in a direction that I knew my gear could work. Um, and by doing that, I think I, that's where I got my, uh, I got my chops for kind of like running a stage. Um, and like I said, that led to me working with Marty for that Asian Pacific festival. And I think that was his uh, way of uh, testing to see how good I was. Uh, because it is one of those things you can find somebody in one environment at their home environment and they could be one way in their home environment but you take them out of that environment and put them in a, in a whole different place 
And sometimes the things don't necessarily work out the way you, know, you would expect. So I think that was his test. I, I guess I passed the test. And then you know, like a week later, he called me and asked me, did I want to go on this tour, uh, this big tour? And I was like, oh, well, yeah, I guess so. And then I, he, I said, well, what is it? And then he told me who the artist was. And I didn't have the slightest idea who it was because that wasn't the kind of music I listened to. Um, and then uh, one thing leads to another. We're out on tour on this thing called the MTV Tour. And that was their first tour. That was in that was the summer of 89. Um, and on that tour was, uh, it was uh, Tone Loke, um, Tony, Tony, Tony. Uh, Lisa Lisa and the Cult Jam, Information Society, Was Not Was, and Paul Abdul. And Paul Abdul was the, who I was working for with Marty. So <clears throat> that was my first like big touring foray into the business is with, uh, was, with was Paul Abdul in 89. Um, that tour led to you know, another tour with Marty uh, in, in, uh, in 91, I think it was 91. Yeah. I think that was when Spellbound, the Spellbound tour happened. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm skipping one before, before that, I think is when I did Millie Vanilli. I did Millie Vanilli. I think after that, after that MTV tour, so I did Millie Vanilli to Paul Abdul, out of Paul Abdul, to Janet Jackson in 93. The tour went from 93. That tour went, we rehearsed in 93. And then we went out in 94. That tour went all the way from 94 to the end of 94. <clears throat> and then um, the original man, the manager that did Janet Jackson's tour in 89, the Rhythm Nation tour was the great Roger Davies, who was probably one of the best in the business. Uh, I, I think he's definitely the best in the business. Uh, he was the manager for the Rhythm Nation State tour, but the, the next tour Janet did, he didn't do it. That was Howard Kaufman who was the manager. Once that ran its course, Janet went back to Roger and Roger came in. And one of the things he first did, first things he said is he wanted to see, he wanted to see what we were touring with and he wanted it all set up. And we, we set everything up for him and he came in and he looked around and he'd ask me, you know, what things did, how did that work? How many guys did it take to, to build it? How many trucks did it go in? He didn't, you know, he was make, putting his list together and he was getting rid of stuff. He was, he was, trying to make the set smaller. He was trying to make production smaller because his plan was to take that show and do a Pacific Rim tour, which would be in like Singapore, Bangkok, Philippines, uh, to Australia, and then out of there off to Europe. Um, and I figured I was going to get, I was going to get cut because it's on that, on that two, on the Janet tour, it was two production managers. It was me and Tom Hudak. And I was like, I was like okay, uh, Tom's going to be the guy. They're going to keep him. They're going to get rid of me. So, you know, I, I was pretty certain. But they decided to keep me. And, and at, this uh, point, at this point, you guys are stage managing? I'm stage man. Yeah, I'm a stage okay. manager. I, had, okay. I, I did, wasn't doing sound. I still did sound on the side. I did sound with a, a, a live sound for this guy named George Howard. It was another artist that I met at the theater. Uh, we would do little little runs, little tours, and then I would also do sound for uh, this gospel group called the Winans uh, and and BB and CC Winans. I would do stuff with them, uh, little sound stuff here and there. But what my major touring stuff was I was a I was a um, I was a stage manager. So I did the the Janet tour with Roger in '95. Uh, so yeah, '95. No, that ended, that tour ended. And I was, I was a stage manager on that tour. And by that time, the production duties were taken over by uh, Paul Cheveria. So me and Paul ran with the Janet stuff for a while. That tour ended. And then when that tour ended, we went off and I went off and I did, uh, I was a carpenter on Luther Vandross tour. 
I did, I was a carpenter on that tour uh, for a summer. That tour ended. And then I jumped on Ozzy Osbourne's Osmosis tour uh, with Paul, with Paul Cheveria. Because the, the Luther tour, I'm sorry, I'm jumping around. The Luther tour, the production manager was the great Benny Collins, uh, another, uh, another mentor, another great guy. Uh, and, That's um, quite a stylistic shift there. Luther Vandross to Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I got to tell you, the Ozzy show, working for Ozzy was one of the most fun tours because it was... You know, it was it was just it was just stripped down. It was just rock and roll. It was no, wasn't many gags. It was you know, it wasn't a lot of theatrical stuff besides his water gun and him throwing buckets of water on the kids and all those stuff. But it was mainly just it was just straight rock and roll, you know. Um, and he was just a hoot, just a really good, really good person. And 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 as well as Sharon Osborne, you know, the manager. Uh, she was just, just a really good family, you know, very family oriented, very good people. Um, that tour, uh, ran its course and bef right before it ended, I got a call from Roger Davies to join up and, and do the Tina Turner tour, Wildest Dreams tour. And then he wanted me to do that. And then I told him, yeah, by, by all means. Amazing. And Over to you, point, Jim. Oh, at what point did you um, be, um, leap to being a production manager full time, or, or at least working in that position? Um, I did a couple more tours as, as a stage manager, um, like a full time stage manager. Like on Tina, I was a stage manager uh, uh, on that Tina to Water Dreams tour. Keith Bradley was the production manager. Uh, then uh, and I got off. I'll have to say that working for Tina by far is probably the highlight of my career. By 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 all measures, I measure everybody on how far away they are from Tina. Not just her art, not just her artistic, you know, ability, but her humanity and how she treats people. She is by far. For me, the just the, one of the most amazing human beings I've ever met in my life. She she's so caring and so lovely to everyone, and it's and she's that way all the time. You know, some people can be loving and caring when they're when they're having a good day. It's a question of, of who you are when you are not having a good day, when things are not going well. Who are you then? That's that to me is a testament of what your character is. And Tina was no matter how tired she was, no matter if she was sick or whatever, when she came in the building, the first thing she asked was how how I was doing and how everybody else was doing, because she knew everybody was out there working really hard to uh, to put the show on. So I did the Tina shows, those tours that ended that that tour ended in ninety seven. And then I was supposed to go, Roger wanted me to do the next Janet tour, uh, which was in 98, which was the Velvet Rope tour. But I passed on it. And I went and worked for this guy named Bob Thrasher. By, by, he's by the name of Boomer. And he, by far, is another one of my big, big mentor, amazing mentor. Uh, and I kind of try to model some of the things that I do off of off of Boomer because Boomer is always even keel. Just no matter how crazy it is, he's, he's still this way. He stays that way all the time. Um, so I did that. I worked for uh, Boomer on, on the Billy Joel Elton John tour, did that. Um, that tour ended. Uh, and then I, what was I doing? Oh, I went from that to Ricky Martin. Yeah, I went to Ricky Martin after that. No, did I? Yeah, yeah, Ricky Martin. I'm sorry. I went to Ricky Martin, did that. That was a La, La Vida Loca tour. And I was a stage manager along with, um, uh, with Springo. Uh, so it was me and Springo. At that time of touring, which was 90, that was 99, I think, or 98. I don't know when. Uh, yeah. So that, that tour went, it went its course. Eventually, I left that tour. And then I joined 
went back to Roger and started to share to her. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The belief, the belief to her. And then um, that started off with me working for share. Uh, I did the share tour that, that ended. And then I went, then I, Roger wanted me to come back for the next Janet tour. I'm sorry. Was it? No, I'm sorry. The next Tina tour. Uh, and that was the 24 seven tour. Uh, and that was in 2000. Yeah, that was in 2000. Uh, we did that tour and, and uh, the great Jake Berry, Jake Berry was the production manager for that. And I was the stage manager and, um, you know, uh, ran with that, uh, that tour and, and, and learned a lot from Jake, who by far is probably the most knowledgeable production manager there is in the business. I don't think anybody has as much knowledge as that guy. He's like a walk in encyclopedia for every building on the planet. You know, even if he hasn't been in the building, he still know he still has it in his head how to do it. He's just a wealth of information. Um, so did that tour, that tour ended. And literally, I remember that tour, the very last date of that tour, Roger was leaving out the building and saying thank you and saying bye to everybody. And he called me over and he asked me, did I want to do the next Janet tour? And I was like kind of hesitant because it was just like, oh, I don't know if I want to go back. I don't know if I want to go back to Janet. And it wasn't because of Janet. It was because of her her husband, Rene Alessandro. I didn't want to deal with him. Uh, and he he was like, no, you don't have to worry about that. And, you know, I want you to be the production manager. And I was like, whoa, production manager? And he was like, yeah, you can be the production manager. And, you know, in my history of being a, you know, a sound guy and carpenter and stage manager, one of the hardest parts is getting a good crew and getting the crew to listen to you. The problem with it is most of the time the crews were either hired by the tour manager or by the production manager sometimes. And back then, mostly the tour manager ran everything. Um, and so I told him, you know, if I, I asked him, could I, could I hire the crew? And he said, yes, you get to hire the crew. You get that. And he goes, you can even hire the vendors, uh, some of the vendors, as long as they come in budget and come into the numbers that we need them to be. And, he's, and he said, yeah, you can. And so he, he, he entrusted the next, you know, the Janet tour um in 2001 and so 2001 all the way through that's pretty much what i've been doing but on other acts you know because of budgetary reasons i've i've had two hats on on, on tours where i've had i was the production manager and the stage manager you know but I've he only really part. wears one hat show him the hat trick mel show him the hat trick. oh stage hat manager trick. hat trick okay. stage manager stage manager Production manager, washer, dryer tech. True story. Maytag repairman. Maytag repairman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've seen I've seen the man do all the things, and he s truly switches the hat. That's how you know you're. That's how you know which question you should ask him at what time is how the hat is positioned. Well, Who am I talking uh, to? Malcolm, in what situations will you do both both positions? I, a lot of times that that's come up where due to budgetary reasons the budget isn't there to have a you know a standalone production manager and a standalone stage manager and so i've taken those gigs on because of budgetary reasons and that was a way for me to you know to have work and most importantly to have work for my crew because the production manager, no matter who you are, you're only, you're only as good as your crew. That is for sure. No production manager can say, oh, it's all this happened just because of me. If they are, they're, 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 they're kind of full of it. They're full of themselves because it can only happen with the crew and everybody is important. Everybody. It could be, it could be down to the person that just puts out the towels and water. Um, if the artist at that moment on stage doing the show is that sweating his or her eyes or is thirsty, the most important person at that moment is the person that put out the towels and water. So you got to be, you want a, a, a team, you try to put together a team that, that 
takes care of everybody. And, you know, and so once you get that team together, you want to make sure they're always that you want to keep them working. So there's times where I've taken gigs where I had to do two hats to, to get the gig and to also to so that my guys, my carpenters, my riggers, you know, my guys that stay with me can continue working. So I've done it on a Janet tour. I've done it on a Bet Mittler tour. I've done that on uh, Mariah Carey. Uh, I've done it on a couple of gigs where I've been the production manager and stage manager. Um, um, but that's just, you know, got to get the gig done. Got to get it done. Yeah. Um, Malcolm, talk about jumping in at the deep end, your first production management gig being Janet Jackson at the time. <laughs> that's one of the biggest gigs in the world. That's, that's quite the step up. <laughs> yeah, that was. That was pretty, it was pretty big. We were, I think we were like 20-something trucks. That was pretty big back then. And it had all this, you know, automation had started coming into the foray. So, you know, it was a big tour. It was designed by uh, one of the greatest designers in the, in the business, uh, uh, Mark Fisher, who also did a lot of the other tours. He, Mark Fisher did uh, the Tina tour. He did the other, he did another Janet tour. He did all the bigger, he did, you know, Mark did, you know, U2 and the Rolling Stones and Mark's, for a Mark's thing was all architectural big pieces. So that was always, uh, uh, it was always a challenge to always try to make that work and, and, and to pull it off. Yeah. Well, you clearly killed it because the job kept coming from there. But I wanted to, can, you've talked a lot about crew here and, and you dropped two absolutely golden nuggets in that last seg segment, both crew related. And I want to just highlight those in case anyone didn't catch them. Um, first, you talked about people being judged on when you know the the five percent of time when things are not going well, and and how people respond in that situation when the chips are down, when things are hitting the fan, and being able to produce and be personable in that situation is what separates somebody who's good at their job from somebody who's great and, and I think that applies in all all careers and in all industries but especially in ours given the, mm. the 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 real stresses and strains on crew and the, the the hours we work and the time constraints we work to I think that is such an important uh, piece for anyone watching this who wants to know how to excel in this industry and the second one was was about every crew member being equally important, and you know, about the when the artist has sweat in their eyes and the top, that's that's such a, a golden nugget there. I really I really think that's so important because yeah, it it, it it's a team effort. It really is out there on the road, and there are a myriad of situations where. Any number, any one member on the crew might be the most important person at that given time. And, and I just, I wanted to reinforce them. I thought they were such great points that you made there. Um, but to take that on a little bit, you know, you clearly place a huge importance on putting a great team together and a team that shares that work ethic that you talked about before. Um, can you tell us about building a team and how being able to handpick the crew that you want on that team helps when you're putting out a, a huge monster tour, you know, with huge production, like the Janet tour you mentioned there or Pink or Beyonce. What goes into building that size of crew and how does, how does it impact on, on the production when you can handpick them like that? You know, my, the key thing for me is trying to get uh, women and men that work together as a team because it, it truly is a team effort, you know, because I've been on, like I said, I've been on other tours where it wasn't a team effort. It was just scattered. Everybody was, uh, everybody was in it for themselves. And it just makes the day harder and longer because, you know, everybody's just fending for themselves. They're only thinking about themselves from the start in the morning when, you know, like you say, the lighting guys who come in early and they're running cable and laying cable on the ground 
and you're still trying to get set carts and rigging boxes and everything else out on the floor, but they're putting their cables down that won't be used till you no know, hours later. And you're trying to get them to understand that, that that doesn't need to happen. You can you can wait to put that cable down. And 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 if you do need to put the cable down, I brought cable ramps. Oh, that the cables go in so that the carts and everything can go over so you don't have to lift the cable up every time a cart comes in. Or you don't have to worry about cutting through the cable. You know, it's just really simple things of getting people to work together. Uh, and and the, the guys, the men and women who work with me, they know that I'm the one, I'm one of the first ones to walk in the building. I'm one of the last ones to leave. When I'm in the building, I'm I'm I normally the way I normally run it, depending upon how big the show is. If it's a stadium show, I do a little, I do different things. I'll have like I usually have like two stage managers that kind of deal with the trucks and stuff but in like an arena tour i normally dump the trucks and i have my crew come in depending upon when they need to be in the building because that's another thing i try not to have i try not to have crew in the building when they don't need to be there uh because that just sets up more fatigue and more angst because you're sitting around waiting when they didn't have to be there. It could have still been in a hotel or they could have been on the bus or whatever. I only want you in when you need to, when I need, when I'm, when I'm got ready, ready for you to go to work. Um, and, and my crew knows that I'm going to do anything. If I need to push the speakers in, I'll push speakers in. If I need to lay cable and pull four out, I'll pull four out. I'll do almost anything except go up in the grid. I'm, I'm, I'm staying on the floor. I don't, I don't go up there. I stay down. I learned that early on that I don't want to be higher than about 20 feet off the ground if, 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 if that's that high. So everybody that I work with knows that Malcolm's going to do whatever he needs to do to get the gig done. And we need to all help. And if, if I need to grab some lighting guys to help push speakers and I go, hey, come over and help me push these speakers, they know if they want to stay out there with me, you're going to push speakers until I get them past past you so you don't bring your trusses down in a way where nobody else can work. Um, but the, one of the most key important things for me for a crew is, is hiring guys, men and women with a good attitude. You know, and I understand everybody's not going to be happy every day. And everybody's not going to have a good day every day. But if your, your bad days outweigh your good days and those bad days start to affect your your work ethic and how you treat your other fellow uh, crew members, then that becomes a problem for me. And, you know, uh, I find I find that difficult because I've had to deal with people like that that I couldn't get rid of. Now, as being the production manager, one of the key things, the, one of the best things about being a production manager uh, is being able to, unfortunately, it, to get rid of people, people that don't fit the mold that it needs to be. And we need to be working together as one because the, the, the main factor is that then when it's all said and done at the end of the day, when the artist hits the stage and that spotlight is on them, they want, I want them to know that the crew has done their best from the guy who puts out the tiles and water to the rigor, to the lighting crew, the sound, everybody's done their best. And everybody's worked together collectively to give them their show. Um, I'll take somebody who's not the best at what they do over somebody who is probably like the best at what they do, but they have a shitty attitude. I'd rather take somebody, a man, a, a, a young guy or a young woman who isn't the best at what they do, but has a good heart, has a great work ethic, and is willing to learn. I'll take that over anybody. And I know most likely I can mold them to be the best that they can be given the tools that I can offer to them, you know? Uh, and that's what kind of happened to me. So I try to do the same thing. I try to, you know, got to play it forward, you know, got to play it forward. Um, yeah. And I, and I also, I, I also, I try to hire as many women uh, on crews because uh, 
I got to tell you, some of the best crews are women. You know why? Because they listen and they can multitask. You can just tell them what, here, go out, do this gig. This is whatever, you know, they could be lighting crew, they could be sound crew, they could be whatever. You give them the thing, go over there, get this done. They get it done. Where sometimes guys think they know it all. It's like, you know, it's like the old cliche where the guy's driving and he's lost and his girlfriend or his wife knows he's lost, but he's never going to ask for direction because he can't, <laughs> he can't bring it to himself to admit that he's fucking lost. <laughs> and that's true. how sometimes... That's how crews are sometimes, you know, yeah. they just, guys just can't, can't, they can't bring themselves to go, Hey, just ask the question, dude, just come over and ask the question. Mm -hmm. You know, that happened to me. I mean, my very, my very first gig at the theater where I worked at, they told me to go work on this bar at this th at the theater. And I, and I was trying to take part of the bar apart because they were getting rid of the popcorn machines and all the other stuff to make it an actual real bar to sell liquor. And I went back there working on stuff and I, I broke a pipe and this water flowing everywhere. And I'm freaking out thinking I'm going to get fired. And I was just back there trying to figure some kind of way to get the water turned off. And then Steve Schneider, the technical director who hired me, he kind of pops his head over the top of the bar to look down at me. And he goes, Hey buddy, what's going on down there? I go, Oh, I'm, I'm <laughs> I'm doing okay. He goes, look, I got a leak over there. What's going on? I go, yeah, I, I, I broke this pipe, but I, I don't know how I did it. And he go, he jumped back there. He goes, oh yeah, just come over here. We'll do this. Do 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 do. He cut the water off. He goes, this is what you do. And then he was like, okay, if you need anything, come see me later. And that was it. And I thought I was, I just knew I was fired. I just knew I was fired. But that was, that was how Steve was. It was, and that's how the theater was. It was like. You know, you, you just do your best. And if you make a mistake while you're doing it, but you were doing your best, you move on. You know, don't hold it over anybody's head. You know, they were learning. They were trying to get through. And you just move on. So, you know, same thing far with, sorry, as far as crews. Just try to hire your best guy, men and women. And um, because the production marriage is only as good as the, as his crew because you can't you can't be everywhere you can't do everything if i could do everything i wouldn't be wasting my time in the music business i'd be solving more important problems like you no know, the ecology or or all the other stuff that's problems that we got in the world but you know so right now i'm just pushing boxes around the world for pop stars rock stars so and Malcolm, the ladies of production are cheering and jumping around up and down. Thank you for your vote for the ladies of production. Just oh, thank, yeah. you. thank you for seeing us. We appreciate that. Oh, it's just, it, 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 and that's, it's just a given. You know, you like I said, you're just trying to hire your best crew because you're only, you're only good as your crew. So, you know, I've, uh, even on pink, we had, I had these two young ladies that were on the lighting crew and, uh, and it was a pretty big, pr pretty sizable lighting crew. But those two ladies, they weren't the crew chiefs, but the crew listened to them. <laughs> they ran it. They did, they did everything. Um, and they were such, uh, such good ladies, such, such amazing ladies. So, you know, like I said, you, you're only as good as, you're only as good as your crew. You're only as good as your crew. And I, I wanted to just pick up on your previous point as well, which I think is really important. And I think what you're, you know, you're saying there that it's, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you know, the read I, I got on it was that it's easier to teach somebody to be better at their job than it is to teach someone not to be an asshole, right? Yeah, that is true. That's usually, they, their, their nature, whatever their nature is, is very hard to get to, for someone to change their nature. So, um, and you know, like I said, you can't, I've been, on tours where you you can't get rid of them that person because either they are related to somebody in the band or the artist or or their best friend or something like that. so you can't get rid of them but i can put you on an island and i've done that it's like if you've pissed me off and i know you're pissing off people in the crew i can't fire you because you know you're tied to the artist but i can't put you on the island i can't put you over there where you you will know you're you're isolated you're over there. We're over here doing our thing, having a good time. Cause I like, I like to, I like to joke and I like to have fun loading in. Cause I think we are, if you're in the business 
of show and you get to a certain level of it, I consider it a blessing. I consider it a huge blessing. Uh, and no one, I don't know of anybody that was kidnapped and somebody put a gun to their head and forced them to go on the road. You know, if you are out there, wave a white flag, go, hey, I want to get out of here. And somebody will rescue you. Someone will get you off the bus, get you out of the hotel and send you home. But don't be on the road pissed off every day. And like I said, everybody has problems in their lives and everybody's not going to have a great day all, all the time. But when your bad days outnumber your good days and your reactions to your fellow workers and the locals, that's another thing. I don't, I don't tolerate a crew that treats your local labor bad. I don't allow that whatsoever. It's, it's, it's please and thank you for whatever task. And I tell my crew, if you have a problem with a local, that person is not lis listening to you based off of you respecting them, then you come to me first. I'll deal with it, you know? Um, so, you know, it's just like I said, you just want to treat, treat others as the way you want to be treated. And, it, and, and, it, and also in the bigger scheme of things, it is just a pop show. It is just a rock show. I don't care how big the show is. It is just a pop show or a rock show. We are not saving lives. We are not saving souls. It is, we are just entertaining. Hopefully, we're entertaining those that may be doing that. Maybe there's some first responders there, nurses and firemen, and doctors and teachers. And maybe there's a, a, a mom that's out there who, who's, who, who's multitasking, working, and, and also taking care of the house. And she could be a single mom, but this is her one day in the year that she gets to go out with her friends. And you're entertaining that person for like, you know, two or three hours. That's, that's where we, that's where we get part of our payback, you know, but we're like, everybody said, by no means, no one should be walking around going, oh, I'm in the rock business, rock and roll business. I'm doing the best thing there is. No, you're not. You ain't doing shit. The most important thing you can do is be a good human being. That's the most important thing. Rock and roll. And like I said, we're blessed to have a job, but it's just a job. I mean, I'm really blessed because I could be, I'm a poor kid from South Central LA. I could be making a living, picking up bottles and cans, but I'm, I'm, I'm blessed enough to have this gig to be in the music business to be a, and to be blessed to have worked with some of the best, best artists out there on the planet. I, I can tell you one of the most talented individuals I've ever seen on the stage. And I was blessed to work with them was Prince just absolutely amazing. I saw him do things where he would send the band away and it was just him on guitar and him on piano. His hand, one hand's playing the guitar, one hand's playing the piano. This is at the garden. And we all know how difficult the garden audience is. There, you got to be pretty spectacular to get them to, to even recognize that you're on stage, even though they, they bought a ticket to come see you. And he just rocked the house, just amazing. But he, at the same time, he would piss you off. He'd piss you, he'd piss you off all day, just all day just constantly telling you goofy stuff, you know, wanting you to fire people while you're loaded in, you know, what do you mean you want me to fire? I'm, I got to, I'm using that, get, getting rid of them. I don't want to see them anymore. Oh, okay. Whatever. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. I keep the guy there or keep the woman there or whatever. And then you'd be mad. And then he'd get up on stage and do something just absolutely stunning. And that would piss you off even more because you'd been mad at him all day. And then he just proved to you how good he is. By what he just did and you're just like god damn him he's he's so damn good oh shit okay i'll get through it i'll get through it <laughs> malcolm you're killing me killing me <laughs> i think we all love that story oh no it's just he just i i, I miss him i miss that guy i just cannot i'm uh, just amazing I, I i heard the new i was out on beyonce we were building the the um, the formation tour when we all got the news 
in uh, in uh, we were in Tampa, Florida, the stadium in Tampa, Florida. And I got the news that Prince had, had passed away, and that was just uh, heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. Still, it took me. It took me. It literally took me about two years before I could even listen to Prince music because I just couldn't fathom him being gone, even though sometimes he was an asshole. <laughs> You said sometimes. Uh, yeah, I'm well, some of the stories you, you <laughs> shared with me, Malcolm, you you had me in tears a lot of times. But we're going to pivot now. Okay. So we're going to pivot um, because when you said that Marty Hom had come to you, and Marty, you know, is Asian, yeah, and you're yeah. a person of color, and you've both worked with many different artists in many different genres of music. Have you run into any stereotyping or racism and how did you deal with it? And of course, I know the answers that, that you've dealt um, with racism, but we'd love to hear how you've dealt with it. And music business is, no, it's just, it's a part of society. It's part of the culture. So that, you know, although you're in the music business, that same racism that's outside of your daily life still is a part of your touring life, your music life. It's still there. Uh, I got it when I was working at the Beverly Theater. You know, I was a house sound engineer. So back then in the 80s, everything was done by faxes and phone calls. So when I would advance everything for whoever their sound engineer was, um, we, they didn't know who I was until they got there. And then when they did get there and then they found out it was me, that was the last person they thought would be a young black kid was the guy who was the head sound guy of this premier theater in Los Angeles, Beverly Hills. So, you know, I dealt with it there. I dealt with it, you know, especially back in the eighties. I mean, I dealt with it just, you know, because most shows say the show ends at 11 by the time you load it out and did everything. It's like one o'clock in the morning. And at the same time, while I was working at the theater, as a sound guy, I still had my regular job as a, as a stock clerk. So, you know, I, I would finish working and then I would head off to back to South Central LA to go work at the grocery store. And, you know, and it was an un, unwritten law or rule that the help should be home at that time. And I meant the help by the people of color, black people who were normally the you know, they were the maids and the nannies and all that kind of stuff. So it wasn't normally, they didn't, they kind of frowned on seeing black people in Beverly Hills at, late at night. So my, when I left the theater, my thing, my job was my, my passion for that point was to get to Olympic just past La Cienega. And so if I could get on the other side of La Cienega, I knew I was free from the Beverly Hills PD pulling me over because they would, I would normally get pulled over anywhere from two to three times a month. And I, that went on for years. Um, and then the same thing on tour, you know, you go out and you're touring and you're the stage manager. And of course, some people wouldn't necessarily think, well, when they would see me, they would think that I was not, organized um unfortunately because of my color uh and because a lot of times the, the only times a lot of uh, a lot of shows if it was a people of color it was al Heyman's show so and nothing against the al Heyman show al Heyman the way he way he did things but i did things differently i i i did things what i call the rock and roll way you know um and so my when I walk into a building, especially back then as a stage manager, I had everything written out. My whole day was on a, on, was on a spreadsheet, was on a piece of paper that I would hand to the steward. And it, it showed how my day started. It had it, a one page of paper, it had my crew times. And then on another piece of paper, it showed when that, those departments would work, when I was planning on cutting those departments, what I needed throughout the day, and what I was going to need for the loadout. I, I tried to make running a show my art form. Because I, I, like I said, I originally wanted to be a recording engineer and producer. That was, that was the art that I wanted to be. When I knew, I realized I couldn't, I wasn't going to do that. I had to pivot in a different direction. 
I said, okay, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make being a stage manager, that's gonna be my art form. I'm gonna make it as 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 smooth and as try to make it as smooth and as effortless as possible. And you know, that's kind of how I did it. Um and you know, sometimes you'd walk into a I missed many times. I remember one time going at I was in an arena and I had came in in the morning and I was asking for area for storage because you know it's one of a big kind of big show and I was kept wanting them to move stuff and get and this guy kept blowing me off he kept telling me no no you can't you can't have that no 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 kind of told me that all day long and I'm I'd kind of as a production stage as a stage manager you just okay your thing is to facilitate and to make things that don't seem like can happen happen so I would just tell me what I can and can I do and I'll make it work and that's what I did so day goes on and now we're getting kind of close to door times and I'm all getting all ready for doors. And then this, this guy goes over to my head of security and asked, you know, he was looking for the production manager because he, he needed something moved to be ready for doors. And, and then the security guy, my security guy goes, oh, you got to go talk to Malcolm. And he's like, Where, where's, where's that at? Where's that guy at? And he goes, oh, he's standing over there on this side. He's over there on stage right over by the barricade. Go, go talk to him. He'll, he'll help you out. So the guy walk came over there and he goes, Hey, I'm, I'm looking for the production manager. I'm getting ready to open doors. And I want to know if the production manager, if you could get him to come out here so he can help me out. I got a couple of things that need to get moved before we can open doors. I go, okay. I go, what do you, what is it? He goes, Oh, it's, it's some, it's some cases and some other stuff that needs to get moved because of the fire marshal or something. I can't remember. I go, okay, um, I'll, I'll get it moved. And he goes, well, should we should, should we check with the production manager? I said, I'm the production manager. And the look on his eyes was worth a million dollars because he had blown me off all day long because of who he thought I was. Not for who I was, but for what who he thought I was. And that is, that is America. That is where we live. People are judged by what they think you are as opposed to who you are and who you prove yourself to be, you know? Uh, and I didn't have to rub it in the guy's face. He knew he had fucked up. He knew he had messed up. And it was like, and I was just like, okay, I'll take care of you, buddy. I, it's all good. And then we, things go on. We had a great show and a great loadout. And I've come through that building many a times and we're buddies, you know? And that's kind of how it is. And that's the same thing with, I said, you know, the same thing I think now for 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 women and 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 especially women of color, they they have their obstacles. But I think if you have your, if you kind of like my grandmother used to say, you gotta have your eye on the prize. If you know what your goal is, you'll get there. But it's gonna take time. It's not gonna just happen. I know. I think the younger generation, because they've grown up with the internet and the TV and especially with TV and the way things are by the end of the episode, everybody's supposed to, everybody's got what they're supposed to have and they're supposed to be where they're supposed to be, but that's not how real life is. It's, it's baby steps. It's baby steps. I'm going I'm to get, I want to get to this point. I've, I've achieved this goal. Then I'm going to go to the next step. I'm going to achieve that goal. And I'm going to go to the next step. Um, you just have to be patient and things will come. They will happen for you, but they won't, they will happen for you when they're supposed to happen for you when you're ready for it because if it just comes you won't you won't hold it tight you will let go of it because it came too easy and when you when you if you're struggling to get to somewhere you understand every step it took to get there and that that goes for being you know if you're in a band or if you were the production manager if you want to be a teacher it goes across the board for anything you know you, you know it's all about baby steps and um and also recognizing how you got there and who helped you get there and knowing that you're, you're there only by the grace of God or who are whatever your higher power is. And, and, the, and the bottom line, truly for me, the bottom line is, it's not the gig. It's not the gig. It's not to be the production manager. It's not to be the manager. It's not to be whatever that is. It's the journey on your way to being whatever you think it is. That's how I look at it. It's the journey, not the gig. The gig is nothing. The gig is just the lesson. It's who you become on the way to getting to where you think you're supposed to be. And, and, and trying to be a good human being 
on that path and grabbing as missed people and trying to and, and help try to bring as many people with you on that on that path. But like I said, the key is is being a good human being, not and a great human being, not to be the best production manager, the best tour manager, or the best accountant. Yeah, you can be that, but who gives a shit if you're an asshole on the way up? Nobody cares. And all they're going to go is, oh, yeah, he's a great production manager or he's a great tour manager or whatever. But, man, he's a, he's a douche. <laughs> well, Ma- no. Malcolm, that's a good that's a good segue um, because we were going to touch on another topic, but you kind of covered it. So what would you like to see in our industry in terms of more diversity and inclusion? Because you've kind of touched on it a little bit. And what can our students as they what can our students do as they come up to make the touring industry a better, more diverse place? I think, you know, you know, it's, it's just a different, it's just a different world now. You know, I, a lot of acts, a lot of people get in by working for different vendors. You know, I think, I think in 2022, I think that's going to be a, a place where it's going to open up because it's going to be a, a, a vast amount of people will have left the business which is now going to open up for more people to fill those holes, uh, and 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 people of color, they can jump in there now. You know, you can start. There's plenty of sound companies. There's plenty of lighting companies and video companies out there that are going to be looking for entry level people. You know, and you got to apply yourself. But at the same time, you got to know you're not you're not going to be starting off. You no know, one month. You no know, pulling cable and all that. All those little gigs that you think. Is it important when you're working for the vendor? All those little things add up to something. And you may not think it adds up, but it does. It will add up. Um, and to take every, every, every little bit of knowledge you got, take that knowledge in, and then eventually you'll be on the gig. You'll be on the big gig, you know? Um, and like I said, I, think, I do believe the vendors were going to be opening up, looking and hiring a more diverse uh, uh a group of people for them and you know that's an opening that's an opening for everybody um and it's it just great because i know on most of the tours back in the day the only people with color was it was me and the band <laughs> <laughs> and then sometimes i know on some shows you know some audience members or somebody would say something to me and they would go oh aren't you one of the dancers? And I'd be like, what? <laughs> no, I'm not no dancer. I'm, you see me over here, I'm pushing boxes, you know, <laughs> you know, but I think it is going to open up. It's going to, I think it'll be better. And I think it also, it's up to, you know, also help helps with management and helps letting the artists know, you know, although the artist has a lot on their plate because they're, when they're putting a tour together, they have so much they, they're, they're having to, uh, be in charge of but sometimes you just gotta let them know some, some artists don't know that there's not enough people of color or not enough women out there you know um and you also sometimes you get out you gotta hold their feet to the fire because some people will talk the talk but when it gets to certain things the things they were saying in the media don't necessarily mean the same thing they're saying in practice so that's maybe one way that we you know we we let we gotta let the artists know and, and let management know that uh, hey, there's other people out there that we can hire. You know, they're willing, they're out there willing to gig just like anybody else. They want to get out there and get it done. You know, and they're sometimes that I know I had um, a young lady that worked in that was like one of the caterers on a tour with me, and she really wanted to be. She didn't. She no longer wanted to do catering. She wanted to be out on the floor. You know helping the crew wanted to do and you know she would pack up her stuff at the end of the night all the catering stuff she'd pack her stuff up and then when the show was over i'd see her out on the floor helping the lighting guys helping the riggers you know just get more knowledge and you know i said hey when that time comes i'm a i'm a definitely give you a chance you know if i got an opening but that's kind of sometimes that's how it works it's, and, and so it's it's all about. I think most of it is about. I know exactly who you who know. That little, I know exactly who that little caterer was. She oh got her, yeah, she got her hustle on. She wanted it bad, 
and she yeah, packed yeah. her cases and she got her butt out there that little thing swung hard yeah she did yeah. want it she did 100 yeah. percent. she did yeah i think her name was blue i used to try to call her blue because her head she yep. had blue hair that was blue sammy bartlett yeah sammy, yeah yeah sammy good. Yep, yep. good person good good person good girl uh, yeah but you know i think that's uh i think 2022 is going to be challenging i think it's going to be challenging for everybody because there's so many people at the starting gate just trying to get out but at the same time it's since everybody's trying to get out um there's going to be a deficit in, in trucking truck drivers buses and crew and one of the biggest deficits one of the, my biggest fears so at the same time that could you could have like three acts going on in the same city and where's all the crew coming from and one of the bigger deficits of all of it is going to be riggers like for me i i truly believe that the one of the most important people on a crew on a tour is the riggers the head rigger because i don't care how organized how well you've got things planned out if all of us just still sitting on the floor it don't matter gotta get <laughs> in the matter. air and stay yep. in the air it's gotta get, get in the air, air and stay in the air get in the air stay in the air yeah yeah yeah, yeah. malcolm let's let's talk about mentoring you you discussed earlier on how important it is to you can you can you tell us why your mentors were so important to your career and to your life I, I, it's like, you know, the, you know, that these people are, had a hand in you moving your life on to, to fulfilling whatever dreams you have, you know, and, the, and mentors, you, like I said, I, you can have a, a multitude of mentors. And a lot of times what you're doing is you're taking a little bit from each person to be what you're trying to make yourself out to be you know you 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 see in one person certain great attributes in that one person and then you see maybe another person has great these other great attributes but they have something else negative that you don't like so you're trying to take the best that you can of all of it to make who you think you want to be um and that way you're and then as you become whoever you think you're supposed to be the key is to reach back and try to help others uh one of my one of the proudest things I've ever had in my career was this, was this young man by the name of Porkchop. Um, and Porkchop was a guy that I, I, I started working with back in the early 90s. No, I'm sorry, early 2000s. Uh, and, he, and he was a part of uh, the Tommy Sanchez group of guys. It was like in Texas. So you'd come through Texas and there would always be a group of guys that traveled on their own bus it'd be a couple of stage hands it'd be a bunch of riggers it'd be forklift drivers and those guys would go you know austin beaumont texas houston dallas san antonio san, you know all those little cities all the way up and through even to, into louisiana and those guys would be with you through that whole run uh, and there was this guy named pork chop that was always there and and, and chop i remember i forgot what tour it was and chop came over to me and he said, hey, man, one of these days, you got to take me on the road. And I was like, yeah, kid. Did the same thing that Marty did to me. Yeah, kid, one of these days, I'll take you on the road. And, but he was always this kid. He always, always gigging, always gigging. And always had a smile on his face. You could tell he enjoyed working. And he enjoyed being a part of it. And then, um, what was it? Oh, I, on, the, on the Super Bowl in Houston, the notorious... Mal wardrobe malfunction malfunction show with Janet. Uh, you know when you do the Super Bowl, you usually you're there like a week before and you're rehearsing and prepping the show. And Chop was there with me as I as we were prepping. He was always my guy. He was always there. And um, and he in the next tour I was gonna do after the Super Bowl thing, we were prepping to, to go out to Europe with Cher. And then a, a, a position came open. One of the other, I think a, a, one of the carpenters couldn't make the tour. And so I went to Chop one day. I said, hey, Chop, you, I said, you, you want to go on tour? He looked at me. I said, I said, you got a passport? And I think I asked him, did he have a passport first? And he kind of said, 
yeah, yeah, I got a passport, Mal. I go, okay, you want to go on the road? We'll go out, we're going to go, we're gonna do, go do share. And then Chop goes, yeah. I go, yeah, you got your passport, you got all your stuff together. In a couple of weeks, going to be head off, we're going to go to do share. Chop started with me in that 2004, 2003, whenever that was. And uh, he went, he went from being like, you know, the fifth carpenter on the crew to on other tours to being the head carpenter on the crew to being stage manager on a crew to now being the production manager for share. You can't make that up. It doesn't get any better than that. I, I it gives still when I tell that story, it still gives me chills to see someone progress and what they're doing to the point where they started out as a carpenter and now they're the production manager for one of, for a legend. Cher is a legend and he's done so well by her. He's taken her show around the world, you know, and, and pulled it off and to know where he came from and to see who he is now, it's, it doesn't get any better. That is by far one of the greatest gems in my career is knowing Chop and knowing what he is and who he's become and how well he takes care of his family. And, and but there's others out there as and well. And Chop's amazing. He's just such a, yeah. you just want to, you want to hug him, you know, yeah. you want to walk in and you want to hug him up. And, yeah. and, and that's the, the love that he brings to the gig for sure. He's an awesome, we yeah. are blessed to work around Chop for sure. Yeah. I, if you guys meet him, ever meet him, tell him to stop yelling at me because he's always <laughs> yelling at me. That's hilarious. Hilarious. Sorry. So Sorry. with all that, we talk, you know, talking about bringing people up. And, and one of the things that's been amazing is for you to have guys like Chop that you've brought up when you do these massive, massive productions as you do. And we talked a little bit yesterday um, about... Some of the stuff that you do, Malcolm, is not only the most greatest, you know, we will talk for a second that you still have an amazing relationship with Roger Davies. You are Roger Davies go to person. And that says everything about how you crew up and, and what your work ethic is and how you approach doing these massive, massive shows. And I wanted to just chat for a second because we talked briefly about the pink aerial situation where you have you're going to put an artist in the air and she's going to be flipping end over end in the air around an arena while singing and you're the guy that has to make sure that your crew has it that your that your vendor equipment has it that your artist is good to go to get up there and do these death defying feats can you talk a little bit about how you focus and, you know, when you're doing really huge stuff like that, like the formation tour, mm -hmm. that monolith, like Tina on a cherry picker running around over the crowd or like pink flying around, that takes some, something inside you's got to have a lot of confidence to be able to put your, your artists into a situation like that. Well, I think you know, all of that all comes from the designers, unfortunately, <laughs> anybody who's a production manager. That's all the designers. They're they're the ones thinking up that stuff. You know, they're the ones drawing things on a napkin and, and showing it to the showing it to the artist, and the artist going, "Yeah, I'm in love with that. Let's do that." You know, and our as the production manager, your job is just try to to try to pull off whatever your dreams are, uh, and 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 to do that is to get the best crews that you can, the most knowledgeable, and sometimes a lot of that stuff is you know, it was never done before. So you're you're in uncharted waters, and so you're hoping you are you kind of hope that you can uh, be okay. But you're you're really it's up to your crew. Um, oh, I just lost some. No, we oh, are. Oh, somebody we just are, put the pink thing. We on are there. Oh, okay. I'm <laughs> sorry. Going, we we got some aerial. Um, okay. That's that's the woman. Oh, footage. Oh, yeah. Yep. Whoop. Yeah, yeah, that's so that that the like for that 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 her fly gag is all based kind of off 
the uh, um, spider cam stuff. So like if you go to a football game or you're watching on TV and you see that overhead view of, a, of the football field, that's a spy cam, spider cam. So that's kind of how that all came together. Uh, and that the first rig was kind of was built off of a film camera company in, 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 in England. Um, and they, you know, Pink was doing that before I was there. Um, and, and then on the tour I can't, came on, we just kind of took it up to another level. And, and then we had Tate do it. So the Tate winches uh, is, is, Tate is the best in the, in the business. They, there's nobody better than them far as what they do and they and and they 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 take they make dreams come true it is they they definitely do you just gotta you just gotta pay it <laughs> you gotta have deep pockets um but it, it's like i said it's it's the crew and it's my automation team and and uh it's a young man by the name of paul sapsis he was the guy who ran the automation he's the guy who programmed it all and gabe uh gabe wood who's the my head rigger uh He's by far one of the best riggers in the business. My hat's off to him, just to him and Paul for pulling that off, flying her around. Uh, and it's, you know, it's just, it's a lot of work going into that because especially because like we did stadiums, it was easier indoors, but right. when you do stadiums, it's much more difficult because you're, you're trying to, for her, she wants to get all the way out to the other end of the stadium. She wants to get out to where the, the seats that are out past front of house. So you're to do that, you're trying to navigate her to get around all the towers, the sound towers and all the obstacles that are out there. You're trying to get her to fly her out there to get around all that and fly her out and then to get her back. Um, so that's all about the automation team um, and the riggers. So like I said, always, a lot of times it always comes down to the riggers. Um, and the same thing with the, you know, with formation, you know, with the monolith. You know, that was another thing where someone designed it and everybody kind of came together to try to make it work. And that was one of those things that was a that was a, a a project that was it was always it was always building. You were always trying to figure out how to make it better, how to make it safer. What do you do? You know, and then some of the big key things when you get into gags is trying to figure out what the gag won't do. And that's one of the one of the key factors as a production guy, because, you no. Know, a lot of times the gags come into the building and next thing you know, the dancers or the choreographer wants to jump on the gag and you don't even know, you, you just got the gag. You're trying to figure out how the gag works. And then the most importantly, you're trying to figure out what happens when the gag doesn't work. What's the safety precautions we need to take? You know, what can you do and what can't you do? I remember like, like Tina, the boom arm from the 24 seven tour, originally the boom arm, she was supposed to be just on what we call the, 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 the cup at the end, the spoon at the end. And then the, 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 some of the singers and dancers were supposed to be on what we call a kind of like a drawbridge. But we draw. Get I think we're losing Malcolm. It must be that LA smog. I'm losing you. Oh, you're back. You froze oh, up. Yeah. For, you froze up for a quick second. Okay. Uh, let me see. Am I? Maybe I'm talking too long. No, it's it's awesome actually. You're loud and clear now. We can hear you. You're loud and clear. Okay. Five one, how about you, friend? Well, I was gonna close it up with him on his favorite tour story, but it looks like he's oh now he's back. He um sorry guys. Dodgy dodgy uh Fios internet. Sorry. Oh, so I was saying, oh, talking about Jan about Tina and about you know some of the designs, some of the gags. Like I said, she she got on, she didn't want to, she got on, the, on, the, on, I would always demonstrate whatever the gag is. I would always get in the gag, whatever the gag was. I'd show it to her. And then, and then afterward, I, you know, explained to her what she could and could not do. And then 
on that gag, she asked, well, where's, I thought that dancers and the singers were supposed to be on it. And I said, well, they don't want to be up there. They don't feel comfortable. So she was like, yeah. I go, yeah. And, then, <laughs> and so I told her, you know, you, this is where you go. This is where you go, Tina. You get, you stay here on the, on the spoon down at the very end. But when a, when a boom goes up and it goes, start to go over the audience, you have to stay there. You can't walk on the drawbridge. You have to stay off of that because there's no hand railing. And so she's like, okay, okay, Mal. And then soon someone went up. And we, we, when we rehearsed, of course, she did it right. As soon as we do the show, spoon goes up, arm goes out, extends out. And she looks around. I think she, she's looking for me. And then she kind of gives me that grin, and there she goes. She goes walking out on the arm, back and forth, strutting, doing her Tina walk. <laughs> in, in, in the heels. In oh, high heels. In the yep. whole high heels. Yep. Over the yep. yep, that's why I say, who, no, who's better than Tina? Nobody's better than Tina. Nobody. Nobody. Next person, closest person, I, I would, as far as just having the, just having that uh, fearlessness is, uh, is, uh, is Alicia, uh, also known as Pink. Absolutely fearless. The more dangerous it is, seems like the more she's into it. Like if uh, we've got on this last Pink tour, we did a documentary on that tour and some of the footage of her flying around Wembley Stadium is absolutely stunning. And I, it even made me go, holy shit. That's amazing, you know, because <laughs> actually I, I know what it feels like. I actually got in the harness once and flew around an arena and I just can't imagine flying around in a stadium. And trying There's to nothing. sing and trying to sing, sing. Well, that's the, yeah, and she <laughs> exactly. sings. And she's singing and she yeah, sings her ass off. Yeah, it's not and She's not just, she's, she's, a, she's a singer, singer. She's, she's a singer, singer. Upside she's, down, flying yep. around through the air. Yep. She's badass. She I'm telling you, ass. I'm a fan of hers and I'm yeah. a fan of what we do. And yeah. for me, that kind of gag and seeing Tina running as, 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 as into this business as I am, I'm such a fan. And when these ladies pull off stunts like this, I'm jumping up and down like yeah. a super fan. That to me yeah. is just, oh, love it. Good. Well, that's a perfect segue. And before we wrap up, Malcolm, tell us your favorite tour story because you've shared several with us but tell us your all-time favorite tour story as a wrap-up oh wow uh that's so many i think i think probably a, it was a tina story uh this is back in the 90s and we were playing south africa and i think it was i think it might have been joburg or durban it's one of those places we were some stadium and you got to keep in mind back then we I think apartheid had only apartheid had only ended maybe like four years before I think, and you know to look out on the stadium and seeing all these faces these black and white faces out there, and um, we were doing a stadium, and then uh, out of nowhere, it started raining like pissing down raining like raining really really hard, and. So I'm out there squeegeeing, trying to squeegee the deck to keep the deck dry. And, uh, and so I go back to, to Tina's quick change. And I, 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 I parked the curtain open to, and I'm telling her, and while I'm, I'm trying to talk to her, it's raining inside her quick change because it's pissing down. I've put this queen over the top of it, but water's still coming in. She's in there, you know, you no, know, doing her makeup and, and, and getting ready for the next, you know, because it had been like the segment for the next song. And I'm trying to tell her, don't, you can't go out on the thrust because the thrust had a plexiglass top. And I said, it's really, really slippery. You can't go out there, Tina, please don't go out there. And she was like, okay, okay. And it's like pissing down, raining. And then she comes out and I was her point person. Which, and I'm the one who used to, for a lot of the artists, I would be the one who, when the artist would come off stage, I would be the one who would grab their hand and take them to the quick change. And when they came out of the quick change, I would get them back out to wherever they, their next entrance, either it'd be up center or left or right or whatever. And I said, remember, you can't go out in the thrust. And, and, and she goes out there and she starts singing 
And then in the more it rained, the harder it rained, the more, the harder she seemed like she sung, the more she put into it. And I'm still out there trying to, whenever she goes stage right, I'd go stage left with the squeegee trying to clean the water up off the deck. And I'm slipping and I'm falling in front of, you know, 60,000 people trying to swing, clean this deck off. And then next thing you know, she goes out onto the thrust and she looks around for me to say, look, I'm out here. <laughs> I know. And then she, it gives me goosebumps. And it started raining so hard, it was raining sideways. But the harder it rained, the more she put into each song and you could just feel the crowd just rise. It's just, they just rise. And it just gives me chill, chill bumps now. And it was just by far the most, one of the most amazing experiences ever, you know, but I got a million Tina stories. <laughs> and goosebumps just listening to that story. That is amazing. And there's nothing more triggering for a road crew than when an artist looks around and has that glint in their eye that says, I'm going to do it. The thing you yeah. told me not to do, I'm going to do it. Yeah. It's like, I get, I imagine it's like what having children is like, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's definitely, that's definitely a Tina thing. Don't tell me what not to do. You can tell yeah. me, or, or you can tell me what might happen, but don't tell me not to do it. But it took me a little while to realize that with Tina. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I miss her so much. <sighs> well, I mean, I'm, I'm going to speak for everyone here because I, you know, we've been chatting in the background, but we could sit here and listen to, to your stories all day, Malcolm. This has been so amazing, and and you know, your your tour stories are one thing, but the the nuggets that you left with everyone, the the gems are are so important and so so great for us to hear because, and I think it's really affirming for people when we have people like yourselves, um, leaders in our industry, people who've high achievers, who've, who've done it all consistently time and time again, to realize that, you know, you place such an importance on uh, emotional intelligence, people skills, looking after your crew. And, and you know, rather than the, the idea of, of tour managers and production managers smashing down walls and, and screaming, you know, their heads off at people, because that's, that's a cliche and it exists and it's, it's great for people who are coming into our industry to see that people like yourselves and, and, and Marty Hom and the other, you know, amazing legends that we've had on this operate in, in such a human manner. So massive thank you, Malcolm, for, for joining us today. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure, guys, my pleasure. And I wish everybody, uh, wish everybody, uh, health and, uh, and safe passage out of this, uh, this COVID thing. And uh, we'll get all back to doing what we all love to do. And eventually those things that uh, you get to, uh, we'll be out on the road and people will start complaining about goofy stuff again. You can do that. <laughs> Complain about the chunky peanut butter not being chunky enough on the bus. The, the pizza's cold. The pizza's cold. <laughs> it's cold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll be able to get back to that. It's coming. It's coming your way. It's coming. Well, Malcolm, thank you again. Thank you so Malcolm. much. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Um, Bye, and thank you for everyone who watched today. Um, this was episode 74 of Tour Management 101. Um, you can catch up on our YouTube channel at Tour MGMT 101. And if you want to hear a, a bunch of other great conversations with legends like Malcolm, then they're all archived on there. We will be back next week with a spotlight on rigging. So tune in next Monday for that. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Peace Big out. Zoom.